we're gonna get handed, uh, as my one friend says, a sandwich. <laughs> and we're gonna be forced to eat it. So this is a new idea that we've been tossing around to go outside and do the things that we love to do, like ice fishing, but at the same time have talks about conservation, habitat issues, anything really in a, a podcast-like format. But at the same time, while we have a little bit of entertainment going on, <laughs> you know, we're kind of we're kind of tricking you in a way. We're gonna we're trying to entertain you with little little fishing action, but at the same time educate with. Uh, um, with different things and ideally Randy would do every one of these but we found that he only can exist in one place at one time and it's becoming really hard to make you like we if we could we would just clone Randy and we'd have him in multiple places doing multiple videos all at the same time but it, it doesn't it hasn't worked no we can only make you exist in one spot I, I can't be beaver trapping and ice fishing at the same time i know it's really hard i can't we, be in helena testifying on legislative yeah. issues and ice fishing at the same time so we keep trying but <laughs> the whole idea is that i will try to have guests i guess and it'll be it'll be a cast of characters we'll have multiple people and we're going to talk about different things but with the common theme of being outside doing something fun you know just to to mix it up have a different setting so the first one obviously we have to have randy but he won't be able to be here for every single one but randy's the expert on everything conservation advocacy i mean you name it so that's this a stretch of the definition of expert Marcus, oh not even but... close your audience knows so to start this off, this, the whole intro to this series, we're out in the city limits of Bozeman fishing a pond that has some perch and bass and bluegill. So hopefully we're interrupted occasionally by a fish. Hopefully. But Randy's going to take over most of this conversation eventually because he knows so much <laughs> about advocacy and how to get involved which is kind of the theme of this first episode is how do you get involved with you know policy with advocacy with the right now the state legislature is going on in montana so that's like the big yeah. the big thing that we've been talking about and i'm trying to learn it and i have a lot of questions and so we figured this would be a good <laughs> setting to ask some of those questions well let's just warn everybody that when you ask me a question, the odds are you're going to get an answer, but it's probably not a professional answer. It's just 25 years of going to state legislatures or Congress. and Which is way more than most people, though. So, <laughs> but you got, like, for sure. Uh, well, I'm going to try my best, Marcus. Mostly, I want people to understand that you have to jump in the pool at some point in time mm -hmm. and in today's world I mean I think about when I first started we had a little rod and gun club we started here in Bozeman and we did it with a letter and we'd go to my we'd use word perfect the old software and we'd do it and me and the other officers of our little rod and gun club would sign it and then we'd run it through the photocopier at my CPA firm <laughs> And we'd sit there and trifold them and put them in number 10 envelopes, lick them and put stamps on them. How times have changed. That was how <laughs> we did it. And then we used to have what were called phone trees. It almost looked like your bracket in March Madness of all oh, the yep. teams. All right, this person's got to call these four people. And this person's got to call these four people. And then along came the internet. <laughs> changed so, everything. It, but I, I say that to give people perspective of how long policy issues have been going on way before my time but that even though the the methods of communicating and the way you do it have changed the principles are still the same 
it's just it's like everything in our life we get new technology and new tools to do the same things we've always done mm -hmm. so to me having all the media platforms available to us and emails and instant communications those are way more effective than me and tom and Vito and you know, kurt and shannon sitting in my cpa office in the conference room folding envelopes any anyway, one guy's in charge of licking yeah. them one guy's in charge of stamps <laughs> it's, it, it got the job done but yeah it's crazy how quickly that changed to yeah. where like instant communication is so easy and you can reach masses yeah quickly and efficiently yeah and that's that's just you know they call it life or progress right things guess, change yeah and one of the things that's probably changed in my years of doing this i moved to montana 30 years ago and took the big pay cut like everyone who moves here and when we moved here there were a bunch of efforts underway to change some of the things we moved here for and my wife said look i'm not the person who's going to get up and talk you are so you go to this hearing or you go to helena or you go to the commission meeting and you let them know what we think because we didn't move here to lose our access or our hunting or our fishing we took big pay cuts and this is what we're going to do so being the good husband i said well i guess i'm gonna go do that so was that like was that the first time like mm -hmm. that you dove into the first time <clears throat> that i <laughs> this was interesting uh, we had a really, really hard winter in 96, 97, where our mule deer numbers, I mean, we had such ridiculous mortality, and that was all across the West. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of us here were upset that nothing was changing in our regulation. It was just status quo. And we knew we could walk out on the landscape, and you, you didn't have to go very far, and you'd see dead deer everywhere. Hmm. And so a group of us got together here locally, me and uh, I've had them on my podcast before, uh, Tom Sather an optometrist, Vito and Shannon and Vaughn and Kurt and a whole bunch of us. Uh, we started a little rod and gun club we called the Headwaters Fishing Game Association. And it started with five or six of us. And then we made a goal that, all right, let's each go get five or six more of our friends and each of them go get a few more. And by the time maybe a month had come, we had 200 people who were well-known business folks and, and folks in our community. And we invited some of the game and fish people, some politicians, and within short order, within a year, we became probably 500 people. And we were probably the most effective voice on issues in Montana. Just that little group that started because we wanted to see a different response to a a hard crash in the mule deer numbers. Yeah. So, yeah. but I mean, I guess you're not saying that you necessarily need to go out and start a con conservation no. group, right? I mean, no. So <laughs> that means a lot of those groups already exist and right. where anybody might be living. Yep. So yeah. is that, I mean, to the, me, the, that's like one thing that I guess... The lesson that I would say comes from that little example I just gave there is don't underestimate the value of five dedicated people who yeah. are professional and well-informed because nothing gets the attention of your elected officials, whether it's a city leader, a county commissioner, a state legislator, your fish and game commissioners. than a very small handful of people who are professional. By that, I mean in their conduct. No, you don't have to come from any specific background, but you present yourself well, you, you stick to the points, you're courteous, but you're persistent, and you're well-informed. That's, I don't care if it's at the legislative level in your state, if it's at the congressional level, if it's at your local level. Having a group of well-informed, passionate, not emotional, but passionate, there's a big difference. When when passion becomes emotion, you you lose your effectiveness. Nice. First interruption, that's that's good. Yeah, sorry. Oh, oh man, that was a great big bluegill. <laughs> lost him. I right lost him. The hole. 
<laughs> I've seen your tip go down a couple oh, times. Man, you gotta watch that tip. You need, you got, you got your. You need some more. Sorry, mate. folks. Uh, our podcast got interrupted. I had like a great big shoey pig of a of a bluegill on, and oh, he just got off right at the hole. I got a ten inch hole, and he couldn't even get through the hole. They're still down there. I think you need any more. Oh, uh, I got, I got you, some. You here. already got some, All right. But <laughs> so back to the that that idea of just you because some people want to just be part of a bigger organization and some people they're not group or organization kind of people maybe they go it alone maybe they're there they advocate in their own manner in their you know how they want to do it gotcha. and that's effective also but you'd what started me down this discussion is you'd ask me how I really got involved and yeah so uh in 1997 no 95 when was it I can't <laughs> I'd have to look at my notes but over here at the Holiday Inn up on North 7th Avenue there was uh, a public hearing uh oh Marcus just caught a little, little smout little, my bluegill little, was bigger than bass. that bass <laughs> and uh there was a hearing about a land exchange we were working on uh-huh. uh it was a, that's a whole nother podcast but anyhow <clears throat> senator max Bacchus at the time who was the senior senator in montana had a lot of sway he holds this public hearing at the holiday inn and me and all the hunters we kind of sat in the back just to listen because this was really a big impact on our access it was going to affect all this checkerboard stuff south of Bozeman, hundred over a hundred thousand acres, and so all the people get up and give their little spiel. And at the time, I'm thinking, you know, I've only lived here five or six years. It's not my place to stand up and you know be the the loudmouth. So I'm trying to sit in the back and just listen. And it gets to the point where no hunters have talked. And I'm looking in the audience, and I know some of these guys, I, you know. And uh, Senator Bacchus is about ready to close the hearing. He's like, anyone else got anything to say? And I'm like, hell with it. I stand up, and I give, I don't even know what I said, really, other than about the importance of the hunting community and how so much of the conservation work that now everybody wants to take advantage of was funded and advocated for by hunters. And so when I got done, the whole room is looking at me and I'm thinking, oh, I must have dropped an F-bomb or something. Uh, Cause coming from a logging family, when I get that wound up, uh, sometimes it slips out. Uh, but afterwards, Senator Bacchus comes up to me and he says, you know, I've been to hearings all over this part of Montana on this issue and you're the first time a hunter stood up and spoke. So he gave me his card and introduced me to Alicia Bradshaw, his staff person at the time, and said, anytime you hunters need something, call Alicia. So uh, it wasn't that I decided I was gonna do this. Mm -hmm. It just, it struck me at the time and I wasn't gonna stand there and let it, let this perspective of hunters be ignored. And not that they were trying to ignore it. We just weren't saying anything. Yeah. So after that, uh, Senator Bacchus's staff, uh, we had Senator Burns at the time. Uh, they were looking for a conduit to the hunting community. And I just ended up <laughs> being one of those. So, uh, and it just kind of went from there. I, I ended up going back to D.C. multiple times, um, go to the Helena, our state legislature, very very often uh so that was mo how i got into advocacy it, it was driven by the fact that i love wild places and wild things i realized that my hunting was a function of having accessible public land out my back door mm -hmm. and i had a son who at that time five or six years old he's your age uh he he was what was in my mind is you know if we don't advocate for these things and protect these things he's not going to have the chance that i was going to have and it was that simple i i wish i could tell you yeah i got into it based on some you know big plan big idea that i had 
but it yeah. was mostly just my concern about where it was going. The question is, how do I get involved? Mm-hmm. But it's it's that's like so vague, and right. so to me, I I feel like one of the first steps is educating your like right understanding the issues and even knowing when there is an issue yep and so i think is that essentially that's like what you're talking about with the if you're joining groups those help you stay involved is there like Mm -hmm. what ways do you keep informed like and know what's going on yeah and what are that's i think that's one of the first steps is to even know what's going on Mm -hmm. and to understand the issues yeah that that's for sure the first step because how many times have you or I said, hey, did you hear about this? And some of our friends are like, what are you talking about? Right. Oh, that can't be. Like, no, there's a bill or there's an effort underway, da, da, da. Well, and obviously social media and, mm-hmm. you know, the Internet's made it a lot easier. Way, and, way easier. And you can yeah. hear about that stuff. But, I mean, is there anything in particular that you, like, try yeah. to keep track of? And, and obviously, <laughs> and maybe even you personally might be different than... Mm-hmm. someone just diving into this because you do have a lot of personal connections it sounds like which I, right. is probably one of the best ways but <laughs> i mean in terms of if you, if you don't know politicians you don't know anybody that's high up in these mm-hmm. it, back in the day what it was is you sent your ten dollars to some group and they put you on their legislative mailing list okay today you don't even have to do that you just go and say, check the box. Says, I want, I want you to contact me on hunting and fishing issues. And I subscribe to I don't know how many digital alert newsletter groups mm-hmm. because it may not be a just pure hunting and fishing group that discovers something's going on. It might be a general conservation group. It might be a land trust. It might be whatever. And I know we all get enough emails. But that's how I stay informed. And if I was getting into this right now, I'd start with just what you said is get informed. Okay. Informed about the issues in your community, in your state. Because we're in Montana, but everything we're going to talk about, wherever this goes, we could be sitting in Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Washington, and the same general issues, same concepts, same principles are going to apply. Yeah. So first, yeah, get informed. Uh, Find ways through your network of people, through the platforms you subscribe to, and stay informed. Yep. And so the next thing, and I think this has happened to everyone, is you hear about something. Like, Mm -hmm. did you hear about (laughs) SB whatever? And then so you hear this, you hear a bill, a number, I mean, maybe it's not even bill, but we'll use that as an example because Mm -hmm. the legislature's going on right now. But... So you hear about it. Yep. Like, did you hear about this? It's going to do this. You hear about it on social media from your friend, whatever. Mm-hmm. So then, like, what's your next step? You, you decide, like, I feel strongly one right. way or the other. Like, I either strongly oppose that or strongly support it. How, what, like, what do you do from there? Like, right. what, how do you even go about knowing who to contact? Who do you weigh in? When do you weigh in? Yeah, I'd say before you start contacting people, don't make the mistake I did. A couple times I relied on someone saying, did you hear about this? Mm -hmm. And instantly I started contacting people. And I hadn't done my own homework to educate myself. So first is being informed and aware. Right. Then is get educated. And by educated, I mean, go read whatever the bill or the policy is and see how it applies to you and the interests that you have. Because sometimes... You'll rely on others because we're all busy, right? And we don't have the time to do this or do that. So we're like, well, I trust this person. And usually you can, but never never just go without doing your own, even if it's five minutes of education. Read the bill. Go read some comments. You can almost see who's for it or against it. That'll give you a, a really good roadmap of, is this... You know, if there's some group that historically is always an adversary to hunting and fishing and conservation and they're sponsoring something, right there you can kind of say, well, that's a really important piece of information. I'm going to learn a little bit more about this. Um, and it does, like you said, it doesn't have to be a bill. It can be a new policy action being taken by a state agency. Maybe your fish and game commission or your department of natural resources or maybe it's federal maybe it's you know department of interior 
Forest Service or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. All of those, the, after you've become informed and aware, become educated. So I've been trying to like get more involved in the last few years. Yep. And just, you know, I will email people occasionally, you know, it's, and it's usually because someone tells me like, these are the people you need to contact. Like, okay. Yep. So these are the, whatever it is, the eight people, the 10 people, the, or maybe mm -hmm. it's just one person that you're, that you should be contacting. Um, so I'm like, okay. And then I, you craft a message, whether you're calling them or, or, um, emailing them but my yep. big my fear is always that i'm not educated enough yeah and i think i don't know i mean correct me if i'm wrong but even if you maybe aren't the like the absolute expert on it yeah. your opinion still matters yeah and i like ooh, missed him yeah. almost had fish man. Yeah. but anyway i feel like yeah you nobody is going to be an expert and i'll even go so far as to say in a situation where you have citizen legislators, they're not experts. There's different ways to weigh in, right? And mm -hmm. so can you talk about maybe there's emailing, there's calling right. your legislators before, like maybe when the bill's in committee, but then it's like it's different when it gets out of committee. Yeah. And then there's also t different times to testify. Right. And like it seems like testifying in person after talking with those guys is – the most effective way to do it but at the same time not everyone has time right so i guess i don't know if you can walk through like yeah when it's is it it's still worth it's still it's, worth to weigh in so when it when it's a legislative issue like this it follows a certain path when it's in front of your game and fish commission it follows another path uh when it's a policy change of an agency it follows another path so but all of those paths allow for public input so that public input can be like you said in person go there during the hearing and the, when they're taking testimony uh, now with technology they're allowing that to be done remotely through video feed um, so that's a possibility uh, emails is, an, is another possibility but email if you talk to any legislator they're going to look at, is this something that you wrote three or four of your own sentences, or is this a form letter? Right. Three or four of your own sentences is way more effective than a form email, like form letter. Um, and then you can also be a member of a group and have them weigh in on your behalf. But to your point, the most effective thing is a face-to-face -face meeting, if you can get that. If you can't, in-person testimony is probably the next level of effectiveness, followed by uh, online testimony, followed by emails. And every one of them make a difference. And then when you do contact them, that mm -hmm. was, this is another thing too, because a lot of times when you hear about this stuff, like my, me personally, I get fired up. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm pissed off. I yeah. like, I want to, like, you want to like yell at them. Like, what are you thinking? But yeah. like, mm -hmm. we, I mean, if yelling at someone probably isn't going to get the the result that you want not right? at all so threatening yelling abusive forget all that yeah oh there's a fish oh but. marcus just caught another <laughs> fish he it's the same bass he's caught the same bass three times in a row now you're gonna wear that little thing out <clears throat> but when you do communicate with these people whether it's in person whether it's via a phone call or an email be professional, okay? Yeah. And by that I mean respect their the fact that they've got hundreds of people contacting them. Understand you're not going to always have the the piece, the tidbit that sways them. Right. But if you are professional and respectful of them, they're going to at least listen. And that's the process. Listening and communicating is the process of policy change one way or the other. If people are only going to listen to part of this video or part of this podcast, I hope it's this next little bit because it, it's going to answer their question and hopefully show how the landscape has changed. And by looking at what's in the rear view mirror, sometimes it gives you a pretty good idea of what's coming through the front windshield as you're traveling down the path of life or path or whatever. But... When I first started 
you know, I told you this 25 years ago, I got engaged in this stuff heavily. Most of our issues were handled at the commission level. Yeah. Uh, whether it's your DNR, your game and fish, whatever. Well, there are groups that have realized that the hunters and the anglers, we are not set up to play in the legislative game. So our commissioners, the five, seven, nine, however many people, they're, they usually come from a similar background like you and I. They didn't get elected. They got appointed because they've been a volunteer or a passionate person about the issue for a long time. And so they, they end up getting appointed. And they're really good. They're trying to do the right thing. Well, a lot of groups decide that's not an arena where things work that well for us. So what we should do is take this into the legislative arena. And that started happening about 20 years ago. And it was genius on their part. Right. Because the, anyone who thinks this is by accident, I'm here to inform you that it was not an accident when these groups decided to make these all political issues and legislative issues rather than, as you asked, you know, why not the commission? Well, in the commission, we as hunters and anglers had a lot more influence. Yeah. There wasn't money involved. There wasn't lobbyists involved. There wasn't backdoor deals involved. So these groups and their very smart consultants and attorneys and lobbyists look at it and say, guess what, folks? These hunters and anglers, they don't have any political infrastructure. None. They made the mistake of forming all of their groups as 501c3 organizations. And some people watching or listening might say, well, what difference does that make? Well, this is where a tax accountant like me will nerd out a little bit here. But 501c3, when you hear that, what it means is it refers to a section of the Internal Revenue Code that deals with the tax exemption and tax deductibility of contributions to certain types of organizations. And there's all different chapters, C3, C4, C6, all this. So what we do in the hunting space, we want our groups to be qualified charitable nonprofit groups. So they get their exemption from the IRS under Section 501c3. And it says, donations to this group are tax deductible. But here's the hiccup. They are very restricted in what they can do in politics, lobbying. I mean, I won't, to the point where if they get out there very far, the people on the other side will threaten them. They'll say, you know, if you keep weighing in on this kind of stuff, the IRS might be paying you a visit about your nonprofit status. And they don't even want to go there. So mm -hmm. they got to be really, really careful. Yeah, they can go and they can testify against a bill. Right. But what they can do for lobbying, what they can do to do, you know, your mailbox gets filled with all kinds of flyers and stuff, right? during election season and you don't ever see any of those you know it'll say brought to you by or paid for by and there's all kinds of weird names these are not 501c3 organizations so what the other side has done they've formed all of their groups as 501c4 which are allowed it's a the donations to them are non-deductible but they can engage in the just bloodiest of politics. Mm. And then they start all these little small industry associations. You know, the left-handed Scandinavian Accountants Association. And they form an industry association under 501c6, which again is not subject to the same constraints and restrictions that all of our groups are restricted to. So these the kind of the history of this is these folks on the other side looked at that and said you know what if we drag this stuff away from state fishing game commissions and take it over to legislatures these people don't have any of the infrastructure their groups are not set up for it they're disorganized they they all have jobs they all work for a living uh running businesses you know have families so they looked at it and said, this is the perfect place to take over these issues. So these groups on the other side of our issues 
have paid lobbyists, paid attorneys, communication staffs, and are heavily funded by sometimes industries, by sometimes wealthy individuals who, you know, here in Montana, let's think about just the trend we've seen in our state. We've seen so many of our amazing working landowner, private conservation stewards retire. And when they sell these big, beautiful ranches, who buy them? Not other working landowners. Yeah. So we end up with an awful lot of influence from wealthy out-of-staters who are very accustomed to this whole 501c4, c6, lobbying, PACs, political action committees, dark money groups. Right. It's so just, that yeah. in small states like Montana, we've seen in the last 10 years what other states had been seeing for the past 20 years. And now it's here. And so we as hunters and anglers or advocates for wild places and wild things, maybe is a better way to say it, we're going to have to up our game. Because the trend we've seen of issues that used to be in front of our game commissions now being in legislatures, that trend isn't going to slow down. It's going to actually accelerate. Yeah. So are we going to continue to send our 30 or $50 to some organization and go to sleep and rest well that night thinking, oh, that's our advocacy? Well, guess what? They can't engage in the... You know, I'll call it the bare knuckle politics. They can't. So we're going to have to figure out how we change that game. We're going to have to up our game. We're going to have to start forming groups that are C4 and C6 groups. And guess what, folks? Some of that may not be the perfection that we're looking for. But in the legislative arena, you're not looking for perfection. You're looking for advocacy. And with the the dynamic right now what do we see we're, we're playing defense all the time right yep why are we playing defense it's because we don't have any way or any organizations or any groups that are meeting with these legislators year round so once a bill gets introduced we're now on the defense so when you and i went to helena last week <clears throat> the first groups that all got up they, what'd they say? I represent this group. I mm -hmm. represent that group. They're all on the payroll. They all, this is their paycheck. And then with a few exceptions, everyone who testified like I did were there as volunteers, as citizens. They, they took a day off work or they took a day away from their business or maybe missed a basketball, you know, one of their kids' basketball games or something. So when you look at that, that's a further indication of how hard or how tilted the field is. Yeah. And it's because we've continued to use our traditional manners and means to engage. We have the numbers on our side. We usually have the science and facts on our side. But we don't have the political... I say infrastructure, and what I mean by that is we don't have the pros, the experts. We don't have people on the payroll who next summer, when the legislatures maybe aren't in session, we need to have people on the payroll taking that person out fishing. Yeah. That's a policymaker. They need to understand our perspective. But we're not doing that like the other side is. So we're trying to play the game, and we're not even on the field. We're, it's the equivalent of being at the Super Bowl and being in the stands and think you're going to score the winning touchdown. Hmm. And I know a lot of our listeners and a lot of people who are in hunting and fishing things, they don't like politics. They're like, I don't, don't yeah. bother. How many times have you heard someone say, I don't want to talk politics. I don't, I don't, uh, don't even bother me with that. Well, I'm here to tell you, if that's the path that we continue to follow, we're going to get handed, a, as my one friend says, a shit sandwich. <sighs> <laughs> and we're going to be forced to eat it. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of those sandwiches. <laughs> what, what we need to do, and we have a lot of assets at our disposal. This is, this is where the other side is hoping we never come to this realization. We have the numbers. I mean, we, in terms of total people, there's not a single 
one of those paid folks who you saw testify on the other side of the bill last week, whose membership even comes close to the number of hunters here in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. Let alone all of Montana. So we have the numbers. We have experts. We have everything we need. We just got to adapt and evolve to how the game has changed. You know, you think about all the changes in technology that we employ. I mean, look at us. We're sitting here ice fishing and we got these little portable fish finder things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know this might be a simple comparison, but we adapt to all kinds of new things when we're out hunting and fishing. Yeah. But we are stuck in the 1970s when it comes to how we try to represent ourselves in policy issues. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's... it is going to take some work, but you you know the people I've been talking to and the ideas that we're kicking around. I think there's an opportunity here that 2021 is going to be a brutal legislative year all across the West. Yeah. We just, we, it was the perfect storm against the things we love. And it's, we're going to do our best to fight and battle, but we're still going to lose some important battles. But I, I'm hoping we can use it as the, I don't know if awakening is the right word, but just the opportunity to assess where we're at and how we're doing things and say, you know what? We aren't doing it this way anymore. We're going to gear up. We're going to go hire the pros. We're going to have people on full-time payrolls. We're going to have experts who understand how the political game works because we don't. Yeah. We, I mean, I, I've been in it for however many years, and I go up there, I'm still at a loss for, what are they doing with that bill? I, I've never seen that stunt before. And so you need professional people who are trained and experienced in this stuff to represent you. And they can't... Uh, I, I so often read the frustration. Oh, why isn't so-and-so taking this on? I sent them my 40 bucks. Well, the reason is, is that's not their job. They can't, they can't do it. And mm -hmm. if they do it, they get threatened with their nonprofit status. Gotcha. So don't have unrealistic expectations that somehow your 30, 40, 50, $100 is your advocacy. It is not. It's a donation to their mission work. Right. You know, maybe it's access, maybe it's clean water, maybe it's public lands, maybe it's, you know, some species that you are interested in. But they're not going to they're not going to be your political advocate. So you're going to have to be your own political advocate through either your individual actions or with groups of like-minded people who have looked at this and said, "All right, Time to do it differently. Well, does that wrap up this? Uh... I think that's a wrap, Marcus. Cool. If we can make this a podcast, we will. Um, appreciate everybody watching. Appreciate everybody listening. I appreciate you coming up with this idea of kind of a, I guess maybe some people would have called it a fireside chat, but out when it's sure. 20 degrees and ice fishing is hardly a fireside chat. <laughs> but I, it turned into a pretty nice day, actually. Yeah, it is. But I think that there's so many topics in our space of what we do and what's influencing things we love that don't fit well in a social media post or a three to four minute traditional video. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in people who are willing to take more time to, to watch and listen to something that's more in depth. So. Well, Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for doing it.